intersection with the Holocaust. So, I asked Niles to step up. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Welcome to uh, Winchester Academy. It's nice to see a full house. The uh, presentation tonight is in honor of El Gruer, and the majority of people in, in the room do know El. He was a member of the greatest uh, generation. He was a very colorful character in Wapaka uh, for about uh, 45 years. He passed away this last uh, June at the age of 90. He was a member of the uh, Army Air Corps in World War II, a B-25 pilot and flew, flew uh, 29 missions. He had four things that he said were very important to him in his life. The best decision he ever made was to uh, propose and then marry his wife, uh, Gloria, in 1948. The carefree free and fun days were his junior and senior year in high school, and that was in uh, Webster Grove, uh, uh, Missouri. His proudest day was serving in the uh, Army, and, or Army Air Corps in uh, World War II, from age 19 to 22. And then uh, his best business decision was to come to Wapaka at age 55, uh, join the Wapaka Foundry. He retired uh, 10 years later and then remained in the community for another uh, 35 years. We thought it would be very appropriate to have another uh, member of the greatest generation uh, give this talk. <coughs> And it's our pleasure to have John Grenier, and also with the help of his daughter Carol, uh, for the program tonight. John was a medic in uh, World War II. Uh, he served mainly in the European uh, theater, while Errol was more in the uh, uh, South Pacific. They both uh, uh, wrote published books about their time in the service, and uh, John's is available on Amazon. And uh, I have a book of L's, and that's very good too. A little bit more about John. He was born in October 15, 1921, near uh, Marshall, uh, Minnesota, on a farm. And he'll have a 93rd birthday in two weeks and two days. <laughs> After he graduated, he worked a year uh, to self-finance himself to college, uh, to a business college for one year in Minneapolis, and then worked for General Mills. He was inducted into the Army at Fort Snelling in Minnesota in December of 1942. The first foreign country that he uh, went to was Mississippi, he said. <laughs> that was in January of 1943. <laughs> He served uh, in uh, several areas in uh, World War II, in England, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Battle of the Balge, uh, Germany, Austria, and VE Day on uh, May 8, 1945. Uh, tonight we're going to uh, get his experience as uh, his medic group went into the, uh, the slave labor concentration camp and uh, John was uh, privileged to be able to take pictures of that, and it's uh, quite a quite a story. Uh, John is uh, was married to Eva May, and uh, they were married for several years. They uh, had a uh, a family of six in Stevens Point, and 
uh, he was very active in the community and his church, and they shared their home with many of the uh, international uh, students. Uh, there was a promotion on uh, uh, Wisconsin Public Radio, radio uh, that uh, details this as well as uh, Wisconsin uh, Public uh, Television. Uh, they were very active in Wisconsin Public uh, Radio, uh, they used to put up uh, dinners for people to bid on to come to their home for fundraising for, for that. He was uh, discharged from the service in uh, January 4th, 1946. And three weeks later, he started uh, school at St. Cloud. And he was one of the many who took advantage of the uh, GI Bill. There were about 16 million GIs uh, in World War II, and 9 million took advantage of the GI Bill. After uh, graduating from college, he went to St. Cloud and uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota. He started with an insurance company called Harbor Mutual Insurance Company, which became uh, Century Insurance Company. And he spent 32 years uh, with Century, uh, not the typical thing in this day and age. Uh, they came to Stevens Point in 1963. He retired in 1984, and John, you've had what, about 30 years of retirement, I guess, now, so you went very well. So uh, I want you to give a nice welcome to uh, John and Mary and Carol. biggest group I've talked to since I did in the Center Theater. You'll have to excuse my sitting down, but I'm finding one of the perks of surviving into the 90s. You can't stand for very long. The, yeah, that be fine. Yes, these pictures you'll be seeing, uh, the, uh, the first ones are some pictures of one of the Hitler youth schools that were started at really in the Nazi regime. They uh, were primarily set up to educate poor, uh, pure Aryan boys and girls at times but primarily boys, uh, into the future SS uh, shall stop at the, uh, the elite core of the German military. So the, uh, this, was, this was a set of pictures that I found after we got into Germany, we took over empty buildings. Most of the villages had quite a few empty homes and villages that people would flee ahead to stay ahead of the war, and there were, it was easy to, <coughs> to find places to bivouac in for overnights when we were on our way from Germany. But the, uh, uh, there was a, in one of the empty buildings that we bivouacked in, I found a set of pictures of a Hitler youth school at Sonnenhof in Germany. I didn't realize what it was at first, but they looked quite interesting. So I liberated the pictures and put them in the I have a few of them to, that shows a Hitler youth camp in southern Germany, just north of the Swiss border. This is some beautiful part of Germany. These schools were run by the SS, the elite part of the German military. And the, this was a prize accomplishment for families if their children could be selected to go to the Hitler Youth Schools. They had to be pure Aryans. Classrooms. They had beautiful facilities. This, this is where they started as young kids and they ended up as, as SS uh, in the military. And they ran all the slave labor camps, plus they were the elite part of the German military. Uh, the, uh, yeah, just, just a second before leaving that school. Uh, I had never heard the term SS until 
during the war. When we we got to my unit, got to Normandy right after the Normandy camp area was fully liberated. And we, our first assignment, I was in a medical battalion headquarters, and our normal role was supervising ambulance companies uh, and collecting companies to bring the casualties from the front line aid stations to the first echelon field hospitals, the MASH type hospitals. That was something new in World War II, to have uh, pretty complete <coughs> hospitals in big areas of tents to do emergency surgery on newly injured casualties. Well, the, uh, our first assignment, uh, our unit, the, the war had moved rapidly from, from uh, <coughs> Normandy to northern France, the old World War one part of France, or the Germans, that was the last part of Europe that they controlled, was that part of northern France, where Don Metz and all that area. And we were temporarily assigned. The fighting was extremely heavy. Third Army, Third Army had the job of driving the Germans out of that part of France and freeing the rest, the rest of France from Germany itself. But they had built the Maginot Line <clears throat> the Maginot Line in northern France after World War I to keep the Germans from reinvading, and the Germans had built the Siegfried Line on their side of the border to keep the French out of Germany. But of course, they hadn't, they hadn't uh, foresaw the tremendous change from World War I to II in terms of uh, tanks and airplanes and the heavy equipment that became part of the World War II. So the there was tremendous fighting in the Maginot Line Fort area where the Germans were dug in very strongly to keep the, keep the Americans and British out of Germany. But the, um, we were temporarily assigned as extra help in a mesh type hospital right behind the fighting in northern France. So we hadn't been trained to be clinical med medics. We were more administrative, but I ended up being assigned as extra help in the surgery section where I worked. Uh, they had two, two big tents tied together with four tables in each, eight tables going 24 hours a day, and uh, the uh, dressing and sterilization section tied to that with the, where they prepared surgical packs and all this stuff. Back. So I, I became kind of a runner between the uh, supply part of the hospital and the surgery part. And uh, one night when the fine, when Third Army finally took over the, uh, the Imaginal Line Fort area, there was tremendous numbers of wounded Germans that uh, <coughs> uh, had had little or no medical care. And they, uh, so they immediately became pr prisoners of war and America was <laughs> responsible for uh, taking care of So we had a, I was working nights. We worked 12 hour shifts in this hospital, seven days a week, one, one week uh, days and one week nights. And uh, they were doing from 125 to 175 surgeries every 24 hours. Everything from simple bullet wound, a few stitches and back to duty to a lot of amputations and a lot of very serious injuries. But the, uh, <clears throat> the night that they broke into the forts and got a bunch of these German wounded that immediately became our pre-Ws, they were brought to the hospital. There was a, a convoy of ambulances came in with uh, 25 or 30 ambulances with two of the work, uh, wounded Germans in each. And I was, uh, happened to be, uh, brought uh, a pack in for the, surgeon, there was a young man brought in, put on one of the tables, and the surgeon, the surgeon came in and looked at the vital signs and notes, and he said to the support technician, he said, if we have any chance of saving this guy, he's going to need whole blood and need it fast. And the man, he had had his right arm blown off at the shoulder, badly infected, he had little or no medical care, this, and he was in 
near near death, but still a bit of consciousness. And he, when the surgeon said he needed whole blood and needed fast blood, whole blood was used only in the near death cases because they were always short of blood. Uh, plasma was the usual uh, use of hand up. This man feebly raised, he was a young SS officer, 22 years old. I had never heard the term SS before this. And uh, he feebly raised his left arm and he said, what kind of blood is it going to be? Uh -huh. He spoke English and the surgeon said, it'll be the right type of blood, what's the problem? He said, well, if it's two or negro blood, I don't want it. And I really, that was the dramatization of how these people were trained. And, uh, the surgeon, I really respected him, he pulled the cover over him. He says, take this man off the table, there's a man who ate the bottle here for him, he does. And I'm sure he died that night. But that was my first introduction to the term SS. But so this, these pictures that I found really rang a bell. But this is the way they started. Okay, go ahead. This is our convoy crossing the Rhine. <coughs> the uh, Germans had blown up all the bridges on the Rhine. But our engineers were very, very resourceful. They put in made pontoon bridges as soon as the old ones were, <clears throat> the debris picked up. And then we came, we were supporting the 4th Army Division, uh, providing them the medical support. Uh, but after crossing the Rhine, the regular German army was retreating quite readily. And the, the main opposition we were running into were pockets of SS troops from quite typically the, they'd been part of the guards at slave labor camps and when the camps were liberated they would take off and try and stay uh, ahead of the Americans. And they were doing, doing a lot of their work uh, nights and after hours. But we, we came on to this uh, little town of Ordruf, Germany, that we'd never heard of, of course. And uh, our colonel was in the first chief of our convoy. He took note of this collection of American troops on the highway, and that was quite unusual. You just didn't see that very often. And so he pulled off to see what was going on and discovered that Eisenhower, Patton, and Bradley had just arrived to go through the first slave labor, labor camp that uh, we had come on to in Germany. This was an overflow camp for Buchenwald that was about 12, 15 miles east of this. And it was the first slave labor camp that the American armies liberated in Germany. It was, there wasn't much to liberate because they had the SS guards, Hitler had ordered the uh, management of these camps to eliminate the evidence before the war came. But fortunately, the war was, when we crossed the Rhine, the war was moving very rapidly, so they didn't get a chance to eliminate too much evidence. They had machine gunned about 3,500 of the people in this camp before the Americans arrived. And uh, but the 4th Army Division, the one we supported, that's a, a comment for our being there, because we were supporting that division that was the first on the camp. And but we, uh, our colonel quickly learned that Eisenhower, Patton, and Bradley had just arrived. And of course, this was something you never heard of. We never expected to be near the high command during the war. But uh, we joined this group. And uh, this first picture is of General Eisenhower, one of his staff people, announced that anybody with a camera, I want them to take all the pictures you can because I want the world to know what we're going to be seeing. And um, this was Eisenhower's Jeep, the five stars on the bumper. He was one of the first five star generals we had. That steel rod on the rope bumper is, uh, needs a couple of comments. After we got across the Rhine, a lot of our casualties were in night convoys. Uh, it was all blackout driving and the convoys of the troop units were moving rather rapidly in trucks and jeeps and uh, military vehicles and uh, the SS, there were a lot of SS guards uh, doing their 
work at night, they'd string barbed wires across every road in Germany was loaded with convoys because it was much of the blackout driving at night when we moved. And uh, the people in the lead jeep, to the, they, they had little yellow, uh, yellow lights on the front bumper to try to keep them on the road to lead the, lead the big convoys. That, uh, they uh, would lower their windshield to have a little better visibility to stay on the highway. And uh, the German SS troops are stringing barbed wire across all the highways where convoys were coming and there were a few drivers got decapitated. And so Eisenhower's headquarters put out orders that every jeep in the American army in Germany was to be have a, a motor pool sort of weld a steel rod in the front bumper to break these barbed wires that were being struck across. So, mm -hmm. so that uh, our motor pool had all our jeeps equipped that way, and that's the way they all were. Because there was Eisenhower, Bradley on the left. That's the General Walker with his back to us. He was the major general, and there was old Patton. Mm -hmm reaches a 45 revolver on each hip. You know, this was something that we just never expected to be in the presence of high command. And just by accident, we, we came on to this simultaneously when they arrived. And there was only three or four survivors still there. And they were some Russian PWs that had been, see the Airmen's are in Russia, they sent back all healthy prisoners of war they could and put them in the slave labor camps because they needed extra labor all over Germany. And uh, the, uh, the SS guards had machine gunned nearly all the occupants of this camp before it was over. Uh, there was where we started the tour. That, uh, that previous picture. Eisenhower was interviewing, this was one of the Russian uh, guards. He had, Eisenhower had his Russian interpreter with him. That was the, uh, on Eisenhower's right. And he, uh, this, these guys became our tour guides to go through the camp. This is what we saw. There were still bodies strewn all over the grounds. And this is a beautiful April early spring day. The odors of this are just terrible, of course. But this is pretty good outside because the grounds are just littered with, they had taken, hurt to them out the barracks and machine gun them. They had attempted to eliminate the evidence. They had two big mass graves. We were told there were between six and 800 bodies in each one. And there was one that hadn't been fully covered over. There's a leg sticking out. This was the body shed at the crematorium. I'll never forget. These were pictures my friend and I took. He had his camera, and we. These were our pictures. And we just that that picture. I was standing from over to here that to that sign behind Eisenhower and Patton when the MP opened up the door of this body shed. This was the corpus sack. Crematorium. And I always remember Eisenhower's comment was, this is the damnedest thing I've seen in all my life. And Patton's comment was, the dirty German sons of bitches. You can't quote Patton, Patton without using pretty rough language. But this is, just couldn't comprehend this. And then they attempt to, they set up makeshift crematoriums on the grounds. They were attempting to destroy all the bodies, but the Americans got there quite a bit before they could finish their job. But they had railway rails uh, laid across logs, and they would stack bodies on these and uh, soak them in gasoline and set them on fire, and makeshift crematoriums. But there was, but this was the thing. We had seen, of course, we'd seen an awful lot of American casualties and uh, badly wounded people, but. <coughs> just couldn't comprehend what we saw here. These are poor, helpless people that are literally worked and starved to death. Now these, these pictures 
uh, were taken by a third army photographer that, of course, we had this roll of film that my friend Fred Kirchwell from Iowa and I uh, had taken, and uh, we weren't sure when and if we'd be able to get that developed because the war was still on and you couldn't uh, bring your film to a dress store and get it picked up. So, so we, uh, uh, a few days later, we were deeper into Germany and uh, bivouac pulled into the little village where we were going to bivouac for the night. We saw what appeared to be a little photo shop on the, there wasn't much of a business section in most of these small towns. And uh, we decided after we got set up for the night, we'd go down and see if that was a photo shop and if we could get in there and try and develop our role of film. Well, we lucked out. We got down there and there was a third army photographer in there developing film. He, uh, each army had a signal photo unit with five or six professional photographers that were following the war, <coughs> taking pictures of a lot of the war activity that we see now in books and stuff. But they were, you know, there were some of them that were taking pictures of slave labor camps on Moss as they were, were uncovered. The camps to, after Ordruff, Buchenwald was the next camp that was liberated, and that was a massive one. That was one of the originals. They were, there were still 25 or 30,000 or semi alive. <laughs> Of people in that. That was the one that that uh, we learned later that Eisenhower requested uh, from his boss in Washington, General Marshall, that he go to the to President Roosevelt and have him go to CBS, the head of CBS, to arrange to have Ed Murrow, who was the leading war correspondent in London for CBS, to have Ed Murrow made available to uh, come to Buchenwald to broadcast his news a couple days from Buchenwald. We learned that this, this actually happened sometime afterward. Of course, we didn't, we didn't have radios to listen to news when the war was still on, so we didn't know about this till later. But uh, I, we learned later that Buchenwald, or that Murrow had been brought to Buchenwald and made two uh, news reports days from there. Well, when I worked on this book deal, I had mentioned that uh, I always regretted that I didn't have a chance to hear Ed Murrow give those talks from Buchenwald, because of course he was a well-known, world-known reporter at the time. And, but I learned uh, this Anne, uh, Sue Hessel, the woman that helped with the, uh, put my book together for me, uh, what I mentioned about Merle, she, um, I don't know if she went to CBS or the Pentagon or where, but she got copies of, of that first broadcast he made for Buchenwald. And that's in, in my book. <laughs> so I, I finally read it after 60 years. But the, this army photographer that was in developing pictures, uh, he quickly volunteered to develop our role of film for us, and he made, made us two copies, one for each of us, and, and then when he was through, he, he took out of his shirt pocket, he said, now I'll show you the most uh, amazing picture I've ever been asked to take, and it was one of, I'll have it over here, it was one of General Patton urinating in the Rhine. He, he had met his fellow generals that he'd be that he'd be the first American general to piss in the rain. So, so this this guy happened to be in in Third Army headquarters when the call came in from Patton to send a reporter to meet me at the Rhine at the next hour. <laughs> so this guy had this picture in his pocket, and I regretted for years that I didn't make a deal with him to get a copy of that. <laughs> he showed us that when he developed our field work. Well, when, uh, when uh, Ken Burns wrote his, uh, had his TV series on the war in World War II, uh, he, uh, he also published a book, The War. And uh, I, our oldest son lives in Chicago, and of course he follows the news and books quite readily, and he called me. Of course, uh, all, all my family knew this story about Patton. 
and but I always regretted that I didn't make a deal to get that picture. <laughs> but my son Greg called me and he said, if you haven't got Ken Burns' book, get one, because on page 300 and something you'll find your picture. <laughs> so, so then my wife made copies for me, so I finally had the picture. You'll see it a little bit. This, but these pictures are the picture. Then when uh, this third army photographer, he had been in book, uh, or Griffin, Buchenwald, in many camps, because there after, after or Griffin, Buchenwald, there were tremendous numbers of these camps being discovered. There was learned after the war that there was 180 slave labor camps. Uh, and uh, the, this army photographer had a said he had been in several of them taking pictures that he was developing pictures. And before he, we had a nice visit with him and when we were ready to leave, he asked me if I'd like to have a set of the pictures he had up to that point. So he gave me a set of pictures. I still have those. And some of these are his. This was a picture that he got from a lampshade in Buchenwald. The SS uh, Commandant Guard uh, had taken this from a, a dead prisoner uh, and uh, had it made into a lampshade at his desk. This is from the. Now this was a uh, this was a, a very good picture of the way those barracks were run. And just uh, this was an all Jewish women's camp that this uh, Third Army photographer had been in, where uh, in north north of where we were. This is just the most uh, shocking, unreal thing you could ever imagine. Oh, before. When we, before we left order, if we heard Eisenhower give Patton and Bradley orders, he said, as these camps are overrun, he did, he wasn't sure how many there was going to be, but he knew there was a lot of them. He said, I want an infantry unit and a medical unit assigned to each of the camps. I want the medical unit to go through barracks and go through all the buildings to find anyone that's still alive. Uh, Get them, get them hospitalized, set up a tent hospital unit at the camp, and save as many lives as can be done. And I want the civilians, I want the infantry unit to round up all able-bodied civilians in the area, men and women, into funeral gangs, to dig up mass graves, to uh, prepare, uh, prepare for burial. I want cemeteries made in or approximate to these camps as a lasting monument to Nazi time. We heard Eisenhower give those orders, and this became the model. This is a picture that the Third Army photographer had of a civilian work gang digging up in the history. There was a poor man that had his head smashed to the mallet before he died. This was, this was a, what the infantry had to do to police the and Eisenhower's comments was, and we heard him give these orders, he said, if the civilians resist, put a gun in their back. In other words, force them to do it. That was the infantry's job. This became the model. This was, this was and he said, I want any furniture building establishment you find, I want them ordered to make simple pine boxes. I want individual burial given to as many bodies as can be recovered. This became the, there's a civilian. This was a bear at Nuremberg. These were pictures of the, that the army photographer gave them. Just couldn't comprehend this. Then the, uh, we, went, we went on further deep into Germany, and we were not too far from where the Americans finally met the Russians in eastern Germany. But before we got any deeper, our, our part of the 3rd Army was uh, ordered to move south uh, to uh, be part of the group that was going into Austria to liberate uh, the western part of Austria that Germany had occupied. So we moved uh, from Germany down south and uh, ended up the war in Austria. 
Well, we, our, our battalion commander, Colonel Sanford, a medical officer, shortly after order, if he had been promoted to the head of a large uh, MASH type field hospital, and uh, he still kept contact with his old unit, and we ended, uh, ended the war in Reed, the little town of Reed, Austria, north of Salzburg, and Colonel Sanford had, he was in charge of a large hospital unit, and he uh, kept track of his old unit, and he let it when our uh, VE day officially was May 8th, 1945, and uh, Colonel Sanford was, uh, sent word to us uh, shortly after the war ended that he was now at his hospital, uh, was sent to the last big concentration camp in Austria that the Third Army liberated Evansy in the south, in the uh, south of Salzburg in the, in the Alps. And uh, this was a, a big camp of, uh, there, there was still uh, almost 20,000 alive, partially alive, there were many near death, but, but he uh, sent word to his old unit uh, that he said, if you think we saw something at Ordruf, uh, if you can take a day off and come down and see what I'm involved with here, because this is even worse than Ordruf, but it was hard to, hard to comprehend that anything could be worse than Ordruf. We, some of us, this was right after VE Day, his hospital had moved in there uh, uh, just the day before VE Day, when the camp was liberated, and <laughs> we're just getting set up. And we went down and spent a day with him, and these pictures are some that we took uh, going through this Evans scene. And there, there was still, well, there were uh, 12 to 15 million still alive or partially alive, but they, this was in many ways uh, at order, of course they were all dead when they were there, so it was uh, the odors of the sites were something you never forget, but here there was still some poor people. These were the healthy ones. They were able to get out of the barracks. That, that picture you just saw. This, this poor man, you can't see it on this picture, but his right hip was bare, uh, dry bone. The flesh, there was no flesh between. The skin was worn off in an area of his hip, and it was just dry bone. You couldn't believe that a man would be in. These were the healthy ones. They were able to get out of the barracks. There was some, but the most shocking memory I have of this camp going through it, we went through one of the barracks where there was a, of course we were there just a few days after it was liberated, and uh, went through one of the barracks, there were still a lot of dead bodies in beds, and the, those that were healthy <coughs> got out on the grounds where they had the field showers set up and stuff to clean them up a bit. But there was still, uh, we were in a barracks where a poor, uh, in one bed there was a uh, three dead ones and one poor man still alive and he laboriously crawled over these dead bedmates uh, just struggled to get to the aisle where we were and he uh, spoke English he said, help me help me help me as just as the three four of us that were going through this approached and and I I told him, I said, well, the hospital's being set up and they will be getting to you as soon as they possibly can. I said, where are you from? And he was from one of the Balkan countries. And um, I asked him how old he was. My poor man, he crawled over three dead bodies in his bed to get to the aisle. Uh, just uh, so emaciated and uh, struggling that, that to get out of that bed, but he couldn't get out. And, and I asked him uh, where he's from, and he's one of the Balkan countries. And he told me that he'd been a Jewish college professor. He was 38 years old, and by the poor man, I look 90, you know. But I, I hope so much that they got, he was one they could save, but they were, there were some so near death that they couldn't do much other than clean him up and help him die peacefully. But 
but they were dying at the rate of 125 to 150 a day when Colonel Sanford took over this. They just couldn't. These were the these were the healthy ones, in good shape. And the oh, these these pictures were Colonel Sanford's. We had a mini reunion with him back uh, in the about two. Let's see. Nineteen ninety six or ninety seven, uh, Colonel Sam. We met with Colonel, there was Colonel Sanford, our battalion commander, a wonderful man. We kept in contact. He uh, started uh, practicing medicine in Caldwell, New Jersey. He was from New Jersey originally. So these were four Jewish doctors that uh, had been in the camp a relatively short time and were still in pretty good shape. And they immediately volunteered to Colonel Sanford's hospital to help them. And he said they made themselves extremely valuable because they were multilingual. Of course, the big problem the Americans had was that there was many people from all nationalities. And so, but these men became Colonel Sanford said they were tremendously valuable to the American medics because they they could help. Uh, <laughs> this is the type field towers, showers the our our infantry guys set up to bathe those poor people that hadn't had any kind of sanitation for those barracks. You just couldn't comprehend those barracks, the odors and the rotting, you know, night. This is then this is the standard crematorium in all these camps. And there'd be from some of the big ones they just had banks of these gas ovens, they would take six to eight bodies at a time to cremate. These, you know, we've seen an awful lot of war casualties, but there, uh, war is such a brutal, just hold this a, a brutal affair, because, uh, but the, uh, the, the soldiers, it's either kill or be killed, and so the, uh, American casualties at least had an opportunity to, unfortunately, not being able to kill the other guy that was shooting at them before they got it. But uh, but here, these poor people were totally at the mercy of these brutal guards because they had no way of defending themselves or helping themselves. So they, this was a picture that Colonel Sanford had of a, one of the SS guards when they, the a day the first night after the camp was liberated by the Americans, this guy apparently had some personal thing left in the camp that he wanted. He tried to sneak back in to get something he had forgotten. I don't know, remember what the details were, but but anyway, when the newly fur freed inmates that he had brutalized for a long time, he and his SS guard buddies, when they spotted him coming back after they were freed and under uh, the American military was moving in. They caught this guy and literally beat him to death and he ended up in the crematorium. Then, then after the war ended, uh, we were in, in Austria, quite close to Berchtesgaden. That was Hitler's Camp David. We hadn't known too much about that other than from the news years before when he and Mussolini and Tojo would meet at the top of the mountain to plot strategy, I guess. But uh, Hitler, the main camp area, uh, Hitler had a magnificent big home, Goering had a home, Bormann had a home, the, the three top subordinate Nazis uh, had big homes there, but Hitler's home was a massive one. And they, this was the main retreat area that was uh, near this little town of Burgess-Gatton, uh, and it was uh, <coughs> four or 5,000 feet elevation, and then they had the eagle's nest at the top of the mountain, about 25,000 feet, where we were told that they had 3,000 slave laborers work for two or three years digging through the mountain to build that elevator from this area to the eagle's nest, 
where Hitler would go to meet the five strategy with Mussolini. So we went through, uh, the American Air Force from Italy had bombed this area uh, just before the war ended quite heavily. Hitler's home was uh, badly, badly damaged, but we still, uh, this was on the back patio area. They, they had these, they set up these homes, uh, or fixed up this area as a, the, the, the war ended May 8th, and they, this camp was taken over just before the war ended, uh, the 6th or 7th, and, and uh, there was a 7th Army Division in charge of that area, to, uh, and that they immediately made this kind of a, after the war ended, uh, Eisenhower put out orders that now the war is over, that uh, soldiers <coughs> were to be permitted to do some sightseeing if there were things they wanted to see. And, of course, we were quite, quite close to Burgessgaden, and this became quite a uh, quite a popular place to visit. So they had the, the homes uh, with signs on the patio area like this. So this was Fred and I took each other's pictures there. This was part of Italy's so home. It had been bombed uh, by our Air Force from Italy shortly before the E Day. I was interested. Just uh, we went through the the first big level of this home. It was all broken glass all over the floor. It was kind of hard going, but there you could, uh, there was the, the end facing the mountains. It was all, all the window. It was all broken, of course, from the bombing. But that was quite a thing to see. And of course, there was a whole underground city there built where they, they could have, well, we were told that it would accommodate up to 3,000 people that could have survived living underground there for uh, up to 18 months or something, but, uh, but we didn't get into that part because it was still blocked off. This was one of the other homes. This whole area had been bombed quite heavily by... Uh, uh, then we, after, after the war ended, uh, we were, got orders to uh, moved back into Germany. We were uh, sent to a small town west of Munich uh, where we were in charge of two German uh, PW hospitals that, of course, uh, the, the wounded Germans became prisoners of war under the Americans at that time. But we, were, uh, we had the mission that wasn't too demanding after the war ended, but to be, if there was anything any help needed by these uh, the aid, the, the German version of VA hospitals, where they had a lot of wounded Germans, and big prosthesis departments and stuff. And, but this was the, in the little town that we had our headquarters in. Uh, there was a lot, quite a few little kids. This little boy was a little Polish boy. He and, he and his mother had gotten out of Poland. They had been caught between the Russian and German um, fighting in Poland, and there was an artillery shell hit their house. They lived in a small village, apparently, and, and uh, the, the mother and dad and this little boy went in the basement of their house when the <coughs> war came to their village, and uh, an and uh, artillery shell hit the house and killed, killed the father, and this little boy had a leg blown off right below the knee, and he ended up, uh, he and his mother through the underground, I don't know how they did it, but they ended up in southern Bavaria where we had our occupation duty. And uh, this little girl was a German girl. Her, her mother, uh, there was a small multi-occupied, uh, not really apartment, but a big home that there were quite a few refugees living in, and these two families were there. And this little girl, her, the mother was with her there. The father was in the German army, and he had been in uh, northern Germany, and <coughs> been in the Norway campaign, I guess. And his wife, the mother of this little girl, hadn't heard from him for a long time. She wasn't sure if he was a prisoner a war or where he'd been killed or what. But she was, uh, uh, they lived, this a Polish boy and his mother, and. She and her mother 
but then the little kids used to come around to see me. I was the Italian supply sergeant, so I always said some things to give kids if they they you know, So they uh, came around to see me almost every day. <coughs> the little boy, we were the, one of the hospitals we were involved with had a big prosthesis department, so I. I checked with the mother of this little boy to see if if she'd object if I attempted to check and see if I could get the Germans to make him a, an artificial leg. And of course, they they weren't supposed to deal with civilians like that, but uh, they were quite responsive to American direction. So uh, they agreed to if I could bring him in, they take make him a leg. So I brought him in. They made him a new leg and got rid of his crutch there. And I found a German tailor in the little town we were in, made him a suit. He was a happy little boy. That was one of the more constructive things I did during the war. Okay, well that's that's my show. townspeople knew about these camps? That was a, that's a good question. I neglected to tell you when, see, the division we were supporting, the, the thing that brought us to order in that, uh, on that highway, we were supporting the 4th Armored Division, and they had been there ahead of us. And of course, the, all this killing had been done before the camp was overrun. Uh, <coughs> the uh, commanding general of the 4th Armored Division, the one we supported, when they got into that camp, discovered all these bodies and people that had all been killed, and he sent the military police in to find the burgomaster in the town. So he found the burgomaster and brought he and his wife out and took them through the camp with him. And initially, they, they seemed to be shocked to see this right in their backyard. Perhaps they could smell it, you know. Yeah. But the, he forced them to go through the camp, took them through, and showed them all this carnage. And the next morning, uh, they found both of them. They had committed suicide. Oh. Yeah. They hung themselves in their basement. So the, the burgomaster and his wife, kept, he said, we knew. Yes? Um, when, we, when we see the movies about the Holocaust, all the things they always show them going into a camp and they're all alive sitting on the beds and they're walking out and they have the striped uniforms on. Was that at all prevalent or were they all mainly like you saw? Uh, the, the folk of them were <laughs> lived worse than animals, you know, they'd have four or five in each filthy nest and they, they're just no sanitation and there's the most terrible odors that. Uh, I see those pictures, I can still smell them all of them. Just, just couldn't comprehend human beings. Uh, of course, this is so much different than war casualties. War is a brutal, brutal thing. You kill or be killed. But you at least have the, the man with a gun, he says, a fighting chance if he can kill the other guy before he gets it. But he has a chance. At least with these poor people, we're totally at the mercy of these sadistic guards. They had no no chance to help themselves. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Who were these people that were put in the camps? The yeah, they people were. that lived in town didn't know or well, they they knew. Uh, they were <coughs> but they not uh, right. They rounded up, of course, initially before the war started, before Germany invaded Poland to officially start World War II. Uh, that was 1939. But Hitler came to power in 1933, and they immediately started building some of the, ori the original camps because they were blaming, as uh, 
World War I, there was really no winner. Everybody lost. And Germany, uh, they blamed everybody but themselves for the plate the country was in. Of course, the economy was in pretty bad shape worldwide after World War uh, initially, but it was very bad in Europe, of course. France, uh, those countries were economically on their knees. And Germany uh, was in very bad shape economically. They lost a lot of their manpower, and, and uh, that's what helped Hitler come. He came to power because it was a fertile culture for a dictator to take over. <coughs> and uh, they uh, uh, they started building. Initially, they blamed the Jewish people for all of their troubles because they, uh, the Jewish people, they weren't. Uh, farming in the villages and stuff. They were business people and, and uh, in the cities. And, and uh, so they blamed the, the Jewish people for all their economic problems. And Hitler uh, started early in his reign. Uh, they had the SS guards, and they would round up Jewish people. And the first camps were nearly all Jewish. But when, when the war got uh, going well, of course, Germany was really stripped of manpower. They had every able-bodied person from 18 to 40 in the military because they were fighting in Africa and in Sicily and uh, all over Europe. But, and uh, they, uh, and they, the big, big mistake militarily that he made was to take on Russia because they, uh, they lost. Uh, that was uh, destructive for both sides there. And, but anyway. They uh, uh, went after the, they started uh, after Africa and Italy and uh, and uh, France was liberated and Belgium and Luxembourg and Norway and Denmark all these countries were finally liberated by the British and the Americans primarily the Americans and uh, they uh, <coughs> they had. Uh, then they started uh, rounding up heavily after war started. Anybody that attempted to resist Hitler and not the Nazi system. Any, uh, that's why they had a lot of college professors, a lot of business people that, from all the countries of Europe and the Bal every country they occupied. They took over most of the Balkan countries. Anybody that uttered a word uh, or attempted to resist the Nazi system, they in these camps. So they, uh, at Evansy, we were told that at its peak they had uh, about 35 or 40,000 people there. About half, half of them are Jewish, <coughs> and the other half uh, from all over. It was a terrible, brutal system, all by, run by the SS troop. They had to be pure, pure Aryans. Well, these are for most. Uh, these are pretty shocking pictures to see. But this is, and to think that there's still uh, not too many anymore. I don't think in Germany. Germany uh, uh, to, uh, has done a very good job post-war. Uh, they've, uh, they've had pretty good governments, and they, they've uh, initially they didn't. Uh, uh, I've been back to Germany. Twice post war. And the first time I was there, they were, there was still, uh, they had uh, started a museum of sorts, a Dachau, that you could go through as a tourist. The original camps in Germany were Buchenwald and Dachau, the oldest ones. And then they had the one in Austria, Malthusen, and uh, in Poland. Auschwitz. 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 Yeah, that was really the the first uh, the first camp made just for Jews because they were rounding up Jews both in Poland and in uh, Germany. Yeah, yeah, they were just terrible. So 
but then they had they built many small sub camps because uh, we were told that uh, of course the farmers were farming the villages and uh, in Europe generally and this is certainly true in Germany the the farmers lived in a, a village and then part of their land was a, a spoke around the village so but we were told that when harvest period came for the farmers uh, of course most of the young people were in the military so they would they would go to the slave labor camp if they needed 10 or 12 people to help with their harvest and they would check them out to get, get that many to work for them and all they had to do if there were a couple of them tried to, uh, to escape or did something wrong you know, the farmer was free to kill them if necessary but he just had to account for the bodies. If he had six alive ones and three dead ones to turn in, he had to uh, turn them back to the camp when he was there to the work. But they were literally worked as slave labor, that's what the term. Well, John, we want to thank you very much for your presentation. <coughs> thank you for coming and uh, partaking it. Hopefully we can order a little bit for guests. Thank you, John. Thank you.